Good morning, saunterers. Welcome to another saunter. The sun is slightly out this morning, praise the Lord. So we know what Noah felt like. So um, listen, let's pray and welcome the Holy Spirit to help us. Holy Spirit, we love you. We welcome you now and we invite you to speak to us and move in our hearts as we look at your word. And Lord, we give our day to you. We invite you not just to come now in this moment, but to be with us throughout this day and for your power and your glory to be manifest in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Fran. Good morning, Dave. Great to see you. So today we're on chapter eight of Genesis. Good morning, Rosemary. And I have to say this has been really, really interesting and has made me think a lot about my my kind of background beliefs about the time scales of the whole process that's accounted that's recounted in Genesis. Buenos dias Flor. Good morning, Paul and Alison. Great to see you. Uh, so uh, this this particular chapter is very specific in terms of its days and you know kind of record of time but let's read it and just see where we get to but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him on the ark now just to say God doesn't forget but it's like he it's a it's a it's a kind of phrase that appears quite a lot in the old testament the Lord remembered so and so and it's like the Lord remembered his promise and then he, he he kind of commands us to remember things and remember the covenant. And people say to God, Lord, remember your covenant. And no one's accusing God of being forgetful. But it's like it's kind of a, a way of kind of framing it that God calls something to mind. And so it's no longer just happening. But now God is acting again. God is back in you know, he, there's another kind of episode about to unfold. Good morning, Sarah and Emily and Pat and Mike. Uh, so there's another um, chapter about to unfold as God remembers Noah. God calls Noah to mind. God is mindful of Noah once more and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. Now, I cannot imagine what it must have been like in that ark. It must have been... Um, cramped, very nauseous <laughs> boats tossing here and there and you can't see anything, it's all dark. I mean, I guess they had some form of lighting, but my goodness me, what a nightmare. It certainly was not a cosy story. Someone posted yesterday, what about all the poo, all the animal manure? Oh man, you can imagine what it smelled like. It wouldn't have been good. Um, and anyway, <laughs> other... <laughs> contributions um <laughs> god anyway so there he is in the ark with his family and with all these creatures this floating menagerie and god made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided now that word you know what i'm going to say that word there for wind is ruach which is the same word we have for breath or spirit and we also have the same uh, kind of thing happening when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. It God says that God made a wind blow all night long and it created this dry path through the sea. And so when God blows a wind of this nature, miracles happen, don't they? And things happen. And so it's the same sense that the breath of God was over the waters at creation. Now the breath of God is um, blowing on this this flooded earth and it says God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed the rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually at the end of 150 days the waters had abated and at the seventh month on the 17th day of the month the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat which are in Turkey, and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Now, we look in Psalm 104, just as a 
interesting little uh, side note. It, we have this powerful description. Um, it says, um, verse 104, verse 5, Psalm 104, verse 5, it says, It set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. This is interesting, isn't it? So the psalmist here, who don't know who it is, is actually describing a time when the waters stood above the mountains and the 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 kind of earth was covered in water like a garment. Verse 7 says, At your rebuke they fled, at the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. And so we have this sense that God pushed up the mountains, and you can imagine the water sort of running off these mountains as... And we understand about plate tectonics and how mountains are pushed up and all this kind of thing. And who knows what was going on at that time. We only have these very limited snapshot accounts of things that were going on. But there's this sense of water is receding and the dry ground is appearing. And <clears throat> there's this period of time. The end of 150 days, the water had abated, and the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month. So this kind of very specific, very uh, exact dating is difficult if you try and think of this story just as a kind of myth, or just as a general summing up of an event. This does seem to be a very specific... And you imagine, I'm just... You imagine, we see movies, don't we, of people who've been in prison and we see these cells with um, numbers scratched, with um, lines scratched on the wall as people keep count of how many days they're in prison. I would imagine for Noah that it was... There wasn't much else in his mind other than how long are we going to be on this boat because God had told him to get on the boat and then they would be safe and God shut them in but there they are shut in this kind of wooden prison with all these animals and each other and there you can imagine Noah kept a pretty detailed account of how long their imprisonment had been and so I think that these days are so exact because Noah probably kept a very detailed record. Verse 6, it says, At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. Now, we said, didn't we, that the Epic of Gilgamesh has a very similar thing where, where Gilgamesh, or whoever it is, the hero, sends out a raven to see if the waters have sub had subsided. So Noah sends out this raven. It went to and fro, gosh, to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. So the raven didn't come back, basically. It just flew around. And some people have said, oh, it probably found stuff to eat from carcasses of animals and whatnot. I don't know what kind of stuff there was left by then. Verse 8, it says, Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him at the to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Interesting that it's a little girl dove that they send out, not a not a boy dove. The raven, we don't get to know whether it's a boy or a girl, but the <laughs> this little girl dove, she doesn't find anywhere nice to put her feet down. It's quite a quaint little picture, isn't it? And she returned to him at the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. So there's this picture. Now, it, it, it drives me bonkers how many times I hear people say, oh, and it, we're holding out an olive branch, and all this kind of thing about an olive branch. It was a leaf. <laughs> this was a dove, not a 
not a condor. She couldn't carry a branch. She shouldn't, couldn't pluck a branch from a tree. <laughs> She's a dove. She's a little tiny thing with a little tiny beak. And she pecks off a leaf and brings it back to Noah. And it's a sign, isn't it, of new growth and of new regeneration going on. And the dove with the olive leaf has become a symbol of peace, hasn't it, throughout the world. And <laughs> But actually, first and foremost, it is a symbol. We know in the New Testament when the dove comes and settles, it's um, on Jesus. It's a sign of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in him. Now, Mahesh Chabda said really interestingly <clears throat> that the ark, is, that, that kind of floating menagerie, is a metaphor for the church. And in it are all kinds of creatures and it needs to be a place where the dove wants to come back to, the dove of God's spirit, which is quite a nice thought um, to get today off to a good start. So here we have this um, peaceful bird coming back in with an olive branch, symbolising that there's new growth going on out there and the earth is actually going to be habitable again. And it's full of promise, isn't it? That's what it's really about. So in the sick, the, so then he waited another seven days, sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. So I guess she went off to settle down somewhere. Um, hopefully she found some friends. There, they did have, I think, seven pairs of each bird, if I read it correctly. So um, I guess hopefully the doves all met up and had a nice time together and built families and did what doves do and all the rest of it. So. Verse 13, in the 601st year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. So Noah was on the boat nearly a little over one year which is a long time, isn't it? Then God said to Noah, go out from you, sorry, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So that's all the little bugs and millipedes and everything else that they may swarm on the earth. You can imagine Noah thinking, don't squash the millipede elephant as you come out of the ark. <laughs> you know, I don't know, maybe they had a whole colony of millipedes by the time they left the boat. I don't know. Someone said, oh, maybe the animals hibernated. There's so much speculation. None of us were there. But this is the story we've got to work with. So let's let's try to kind of understand it best we can and trust that God, uh, you know, that he was supervising the whole process and it all was going well. Someone, <laughs> sorry, a little joke. Someone asked um, a Bible teacher once what Noah and his wife did on the, and, you know, the boys did on the ark all that time. And Noah said, well, that was it. Yeah, the, the, preacher said oh that was easy he went fishing and the little child said not for very long and he said how come and they said well he only had two worms <laughs> interestingly worms are hermaphrodite that so that would have been kind of a tricky one to call wouldn't it you're gonna have to just take any two worms any two it doesn't matter because they're both both <laughs> oh you learn something every day on this show right where are we and so in the 601st year, in the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you, bring out every living thing. Um, that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him 
every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families. There you go, from the ark. And you wonder, don't you, just how much procreation had gone on during that time, and how much the payload of the of the ark had increased as things had multiplied, or whatever. Maybe they didn't. But anyway. Verse 20, then Noah built an ark to the uh, sorry, an altar to the Lord, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This is quite an incredible little, um, uh, little verse to wrap up the story at this point. God said, never again am I going to do that. I'm not going to, so the curse that he'd made on the ground to Adam and Eve obviously remains because we still have to work by the sweat of our brow and poor women still have pain in childbirth and probably many see that as unfair that they got a raw deal out of that whole thing. Um, but we see that, don't we? That is a reality that it's still hard work to toil the soil and it's still hard work giving birth. And so um, that curse obviously is still in place. And there's still, as Paul says in Romans 8, uh, the, the creation is subjected to, to decay. That still happens. But what God is talking about is this mass extinction event which happened during the flood. And he's saying, I'm never going to do that again. That is not going to happen. But it's almost, and then he puts in there almost like in parenthesis, like in brackets. He says, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. And he's saying, I, I kind of know that that's how it is. I know that there is this, we would say, propensity, this leaning towards wickedness and rebellion that is in the heart of the human being that I've made. But even so, that being said, I'm still not going to do that kind of judgment again. I'm not going to just, you know, and um, so we're going to, I'm going to make a covenant. And he says, while the earth remains, he says, neither, neither will I again, never, sorry, neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. Summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So we have this promise. And, and it's difficult to know. People have speculated that after the flood came seasons. And prior to that, there were no changes in seasons. I'm just going to say a couple of things just to throw them in as a, con you know, to the, to the thinking about this. It's very easy, I think, from a 21st century um, perspective where we're surrounded by popular science, we, uh, we, where everybody has a kind of level of scientific understanding to dismiss stories like this as being fanciful and just you know, uh, far-fetched and not true. And just therefore then as some kind, being in the Bible purely as a kind of, in sort of moral tale, as a kind of way of teaching morals and encouraging people to walk with God and not be wicked and so on. Um, however, there are lots and lots and lots of things that do raise really good scientific questions that and the study of dinosaurs seems to almost contradict the bible and yet the dinosaurs were clearly killed by a mass extinction event we have that from scientists of all kind of persuasions and there are there are things which they've called dinosaur graveyards where literally a whole herd of dinosaurs seems to have been annihilated 
in one go and then there'd be nests with eggs, dinosaur eggs in and all this kind of stuff. And these, not only are they um, buried in together in and fossilized together, but they're, um, you know, implying that something cataclysmic happened at that time and just wiped them all out. But some of the bones are broken lengthways as if they've been subjected to the most extreme force. And you question even whether a flood could do that. But if you um, then add into it the whole kind of tectonic shifts and change that that we see in Psalm 104, where it says the mountains, you know, were raised up and and all this kind of stuff. You wonder, don't you, whether actually even the 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 time scales somewhere. Gosh, strange. There's someone breaking in. <laughs> Give me a fright. This is Anna. She's <laughs> <laughs> Hi, babe. Yeah. Um, anyway, so. Yes, where was I? So even with the, you know, so it may, if the time scales were wrong, let's just say, let's just say the time scales were wrong in the understanding of the evolutionary process and all the rest of it. The, the flood, I think, is our, you know, possibly the best clue in terms of how some of these things happened and how the biblical account actually is accurate. Um, it's so interesting, isn't it, like we said yesterday, that 200 different cultures around the world have the story of a flood in their kind of background stories that define them as a culture. Anyway, I'm going to leave you. We believe that this is the word of God. It's inspired by him. It's breathed out by him. It's profitable for our instruction and to train us in righteousness so we're thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so the, the take home for us today really is this incredible promise of God that he's not going to do that again. He's not going to flood the earth again. And that actually the seasons are with us, even though they may be disrupted and there may be difficulties that we're experiencing now and the climate change and all these things, given all of that, there is still this structure of the seasons and seed time and harvest, summer and winter shall not cease because God has promised it. So that's while the earth remains. Now we do know as well that God has promised to make a new heavens and a new earth. So I guess when that happens, everything will be different. Hey, you guys have an amazing day. I hope you've got loads and loads to think about and do chat and put stuff up, your, your thoughts up because it's great to hear what you think. Have an amazing day. God bless you.